practically all machinery relies on them. When they fail, the machinery stops, and getting it up and running again can be a real job. Proper handling, installation, and maintenance is much easier and will prevent most bearing failure. Hello, I'm Dave Brown for Teletrain. Today we're going to see just what proper installation and maintenance of bearings involves. And we're going to start by looking at what bearings do, how they do it, and why they fail. A bearing does three things. First, it bears or supports loads, like the weight of a moving part or other forces due to machine operation. Second, it guides and positions moving parts accurately so that they run true without wobble, shake, or looseness. This requires a close fit between part and bearing. Third, a bearing must also reduce friction. In other words, it must allow the part to move easily in it. Now these three functions are related. The tighter a shaft fits in a bearing, the more accurately it will be guided and positioned, but the more friction there will be. A small bearing will have low friction, but it cannot bear heavy loads, so each bearing application is a compromise. There are two different kinds of bearings. They both do the same jobs, but they work completely differently. Plain bearings like these provide a smooth, slippery surface for the part in the bearing to slide on. The surface may be plastic or graphite, materials that are naturally slippery. More often, the material is some relatively soft metal made slippery by a lubrication film. In anti-friction or rolling element bearings, the rolling elements, balls or rollers of some kind, roll between inner and outer races or rings. There is often a cage, retainer, or separator to keep the rolling elements in place, aligned properly, and separate so they do not rub on each other. Under the right circumstances, both kinds of bearings can last a long time, but under the wrong conditions, neither type will last. Let's look at what the wrong conditions are so you will know what to watch out for. First, Excessive loads, or loads that the bearing was not intended to bear, will cause early failure. Most bearings are designed to take radial loads. These are forces that are acting at right angles to the shaft. Examples are the weight of a wagon on its axle bearings, or the pull of a belt on a pulley bearing. Many bearings are designed to take thrust loads in addition to radial loads. A thrust load is in line with the shaft. A propeller or fan puts a thrust load on its bearings since it pushes endways on the shaft. Some bearings are designed to take only thrust loads. In a plain bearing, too large a load squeezes out the lubrication film that normally separates bearing and shaft and allows metal to metal contact. Increased friction produces heat which thins out the oil or grease and makes the problem worse. The bearing metal wears away quickly, or even melts. In a rolling element bearing, failure usually results from metal fatigue rather than frictional wear. That is, the steel eventually becomes brittle and breaks up. This happens because in a rolling element bearing, the load is concentrated on a very small area. Typically, only three or four rolling elements at a time support the entire load, and the spots of contact between each rolling element and the races are very small. This means pressures are very high. This concentrated load actually dents the races and the rolling elements. The steel normally springs back each time a rolling element passes under the load, but eventually the steel work hardens, and instead of springing back, it breaks out in chunks, a condition called spalling. Spalling from fatigue failure eventually occurs in all loaded rolling element bearings, but heavy loads bring it on much quicker. In fact, doubling the load can cut bearing life by a factor of 10. Now what this means in practical terms is that bearings must not be subjected to loads that they were not intended to bear. Obviously, if the weight is too heavy, the bearing will fail quickly. 
but shock or impact loads, brutal treatment by the operator, and dull or chattering tools also shorten bearing life. The bearing designers may have expected rough service, but no bearing will take abuse indefinitely. And vibration is very hard on bearings. Machinery will vibrate if anything is bent, out of balance, or loose. The parts must not shake and rattle. They've got to roll smoothly for the bearings to last. Improper adjustment of machinery can also overload bearings. This belt needs to be under some tension to transfer its power without slipping, but it should not be tightened any more than the manufacturer's specifications. The higher the belt tension, the more load on the bearing. In other cases, improper adjustment of the bearings themselves can cause overloading. If this nut was tightened too much, the inner races of both bearings would be pulled toward each other and both bearings would be thrust loaded even though there might not be any external load. Quick failure would result. So the nut must be carefully adjusted to specifications. Here's a similar situation. Long shafts, as they warm up, lengthen quite a bit. If the shaft grows enough to take up the end play built into the bearings, they will both be thrust loaded. Any kind of misalignment between two coupled shafts or between shaft and bearing also puts an unnecessary load on bearings. In a plane bearing, two areas are heavily loaded. When a rolling element bearing is misaligned, you get an uneven thrust load on the races. The result in both cases will be increased friction and heat and early failure. Now, most pillow block and flange bearing units are alignable or self-aligning. The bearing can swivel around in its housing to line up with the shaft. Usually, the bearing can only align itself a few degrees, however, so for best performance, the housings of these units should be installed at right angles to the shaft. Finally, a bearing may fail early if it is not the right bearing for the application. There are a wide variety of bearing types and grades. Some inexpensive semi-ground commercial bearings may look similar to more expensive super precision types. But they will not last as long. Some sealed bearings may be interchangeable in terms of proper fit, but inside they may be completely different and unsuited for a particular application. So always try to replace a bearing with another which has the exact same number on it. If you must use a different bearing, check the charts in the manufacturer's catalog to see if it is an acceptable substitute. Now, suppose an almost new bearing has failed. You have determined that it was the correct bearing for the application and not overloaded, misaligned, overspeeded, or abused in any way. Why should it have failed? Well, many bearing problems can be traced to damage which occurred during installation. It is very important to know how to install a bearing correctly. Let's start with plain bearings. If the bearing is to be pressed in place, it must fit tightly so that it is firmly backed up at all points. Dirt, burrs, or an out-of-round bore will distort it, reducing clearances between shaft and bearing. So be careful not to damage the bore when pulling out the old bushing. If you are using a puller, be sure the hooks do not scratch the bore. Some bearings or housings have grooves or slots for oil and grease. Be sure the lubrication feed holes are clear and line up. Never drive the bearing in with just a hammer. This will mash the end so that the shaft will not go through and probably distort or misalign the bearing. A pilot driver like this supports the bearing inside and keeps it round and aligned. Better yet, use a press. Carefully line the press ram up with the bore and use a shouldered arbor or steel plate. Do not just use a block of wood since the bearing may cut into it unevenly and go crooked. 
and slivers of wood can get wedged between the bearing and the bore. Whatever the arrangement, the bearing must be kept straight with the bore as it goes in. Large, plain bearings are often installed in half shells like this. Installing these shells properly is a precision operation. First, be sure you mark the cap somehow so you'll be able to reinstall it the same way that it came off. Check the shaft or journal to make sure it is not tapered, out of round, scored, or rough. And be sure to inspect and clean the back of the bearing and the mating surface in the machine carefully. Dirt under the bearing may reduce clearances and prevent adequate heat transfer. There is usually a dowel, spool, screw, or lug to hold the bearing shell in place and prevent rotation. Also, the edges of the bearing shell are sometimes made to project slightly above the split housing surface. This is to make sure the shells are tightly clamped when the cap of the split housing is installed. Do not file the shells off flush or try to shim the cap. And finally, be sure to torque the cap bolts to specifications. Like plain bearings, rolling element bearings must not be distorted during installation, and both races must be firmly backed up by a perfectly round bore and shaft. This means that when you remove a failed bearing to replace it, you must be careful not to damage the bore or shaft in any way. Often, the failed bearing is difficult to remove, and rather than arrange a special puller or press adapter, you may be tempted to just break it off with a hammer or take a grinder or torch to it, since it's bad anyway. These methods are dangerous, however, and are likely to damage the shaft or bore. The fit between bearing races and shafts and bores is critical. If the fit is not tight enough, heat may not be properly transferred out of the bearing. Also, vibration could cause the race to creep around on the shaft or in the bore. Wear from this creep will gradually increase the looseness. Fretting corrosion is also possible. Slight vibration of the race in the bore or on the shaft can wear away fine steel particles which rust and grind off more particles, destroying the surfaces of race and shaft or bore. At the very least, then, the fit must be snug, or what is usually called a push fit. This allows the race to be removed or installed by hand, but just barely. There should be no detectable looseness. When the load and the race move in relation to each other, the fit must be considerably tighter or the race will creep around on the shaft or in the bore. If the load direction is fixed, the rotating race must be positively locked in place. If the load forces rotate, the stationary race must be locked down. And the higher the speed and the greater the load, the tighter the fit must be. There are several ways to fix a bearing race firmly in place. In an emergency, special adhesives can be used. Be sure to follow instructions carefully and do not get any of the adhesive on the rolling elements or the race tracks where they roll. Inner races are often locked mechanically. Set screws through an extension of the inner race is a common method. Tighten to the specified torque to prevent movement between the shaft and race. There are various kinds of locking collars. In some, the set screws go through the inner race to the shaft. In others, a clamp squeezes the inner race tight on the shaft. Eccentric locking collars are common. Turning the collar wedges the bearing in a race tightly between the collar and the shaft. Be sure to turn the collar in the normal direction of shaft rotation and to follow the manufacturer's detailed installation procedures. Large bearings often use a tapered adapter sleeve. The tightness of the fit is adjustable with the nut, which forces the bearing inner race tighter on the tapered sleeve. A tight fit expands the inner race and takes up some of the clearance built into the bearing. Bearings are usually available with extra internal clearance if the inner race must be fitted very tightly. 
press fitting is another common way of locking a bearing race in place. The shaft is supplied slightly larger than the inner race, or the bore is made slightly smaller than the bearing outer race. Pressing bearings can involve very high forces and stresses on the bearing. If rolling element bearings are pressed on incorrectly, they may break or be damaged so that wear leads to premature failure. Here are some points to remember. Bearings that are pressed on are sometimes impossible to remove without destroying them. So be sure you've got the right bearing and that it is going on the right way. Some bearings can take thrust loads in one direction but not the other. And be careful that any retainer, slinger, seal, or shield that cannot be installed from the other end is around the shaft before you press the bearing on. The bore or the shaft must be clean and free from nicks, burrs, and any slivers of metal which could become wedged in the chamfer at the edge of the bearing races. They must also be perfectly round and accurately machined to size for the proper press fit. Lubricate the parts to be pressed with oil or a special dry powdered lubricant. Then press with the right equipment. Do not pound. Never use a hammer. It can chip, dent, or crack the races. Press only on the race being installed. Do not push on the outer race if you are pressing an inner race on a shaft. Do not push on an inner race if the bearing is going into a bore. The races and rollers are likely to be brunelled or permanently dented by the heavy press force. Press squarely. The press must be arranged to push the bearing on the shaft or into the bore absolutely straight. The ram must be lined up exactly with the shaft or the bore and must press equally all around the race. Do not try to press with a wood block or any material which could compress unevenly or leave chips or splinters in the bearing. A brass plate or arbor is preferred since it is soft enough not to damage the surfaces of the bearing but hard enough to push on the bearing accurately. Usually there is a flange or a shoulder to press the bearing against. These shoulders or rings ensure that the bearing is positioned properly. Do not rely on just the press for this, no matter how carefully it is lined up. Shrink fits are sometimes necessary, particularly with large bearings. In this procedure, heating expands the bearing and often allows it to be installed without a press. Once in place, the bearing cools and shrinks tightly on the shaft. So have everything ready. The shaft, bore, and bearing should be inspected, cleaned, and oiled first. There are right and wrong ways to shrink fit bearings. For one thing, never take a torch to the bearing. Concentrated heat can crack or warp it, or permanently soften the metal. Heat it slowly and evenly with an induction heater, an electric oven, or in an oil bath, and no hotter than about 275 degrees. If the bearing has rubber or plastic seals, be careful not to damage them by overheating. If it is permanently lubricated with grease, be sure to check the specifications. Do not heat the bearing beyond the temperature limits of the grease. If just heating the bearing is not sufficient, try shrinking the shaft with dry ice. If you use regular ice in a bucket, wrap the shaft with plastic to prevent rust. Be prepared to work quickly. The bearing must be installed before temperatures have a chance to equalize. Once the bearing is on, hold it firmly in place until temperatures do equalize. Sometimes, as the bearing cools, it will shrink back from the shoulder slightly. And finally, make sure your press or shrink fit has not preloaded the bearing. Like a tapered adapter sleeve, tight press or shrink fits expand the inner race and take up normal operating clearances. Now besides the actual installation procedure, there are two other possible sources of trouble to watch out for when replacing a bearing. When a rolling element bearing requires lubrication, it's got to be done correctly.
cleanliness is essential. Hands, tools, rags, and the work surface must be completely clean. The new grease must be pushed completely through the bearing, from one side to the other in order to coat all parts. This can be done by hand. But a better way is to pack the bearing with a tool which encloses one side and can be pressurized by grease. If you leave the bearing full of grease, be sure there is a way for excess grease to push out of the bearing when it is operating or it will run hot and pressure may build up and blow out seals. You also must store and handle bearings properly. Sometimes a bearing will fail because it was damaged even before installation. Rolling element bearings are expensive precision parts. They should not be handled any more than absolutely necessary or stored any place where they are subject to vibration, dampness, magnetization, or extreme temperature changes. New bearings should be kept in their box, wrapped in the original preservative treated paper as long as possible before actual installation. They must not be dropped or handled roughly. New bearings are coated with a protective film to prevent rust or other corrosion. Do not remove it or store bearings dry without a protective film. They rust easily. Even fingerprints can corrode them since perspiration and skin oils are usually acid. So do not handle them with your bare hands. If a bearing is removed from equipment and stored for any length of time, pack it full of grease and seal it in a plastic bag with a label. This keeps air and moisture from coming into contact with the bearing metal. If equipment will not be used for a long time or if it is going to be transported, be sure the bearings are thoroughly lubricated. It is a good idea to turn the machinery over by hand occasionally to spread the grease or oil around in the bearings and make sure the metal stays properly coated. All right, we've covered loading, alignment, installation, lubrication, and handling, and seen how to work with bearings correctly. But a good mechanic also needs to know when a bearing is about to fail so that he can schedule replacement at a time when it will not interrupt production schedules. There are several ways to tell when trouble may be coming. The first is bearing temperature. Usually a hot bearing is a sign of a problem. Tight seals, tight internal clearances, any kind of overloading, overspeeding, or misalignment can raise operating temperature. In a plane bearing, inadequate lubrication is a common cause. In a rolling element bearing, heat can mean the bearing is either completely dry or over lubricated. Tools like this thermometer probe make quick and accurate checks of bearing temperatures easy. Bearing feel is also an indication of condition. A badly worn or damaged bearing will probably catch or feel rough as you turn it. If the bearing feels loose beyond the normal clearances, it is worn. Push and pull sideways and inways on the shaft and compare the feel to a new unit or similar application somewhere else. Sound sometimes can tell you the bearing condition. If the plant is too noisy to pick out individual bearings, you can use a long-handled screwdriver as a kind of stethoscope. But be careful when doing this. Use your thumb to protect your ear and keep away from belts, pulleys, chains, and other moving parts. Here are what some kinds of noise can indicate. Knocks and thumps in a plane bearing are an indication of looseness. With a reciprocating load, these will naturally be loud and easy to detect. This sound can also indicate too much in play in a shaft. A high tone or whine often means a Brunelled bearing. That is, a bearing where the rollers have permanently dented the races. Random or intermittent clicks probably mean a problem with the retainer or cage, damaged rollers, or dirt in the bearing. A crunching, growling, or grinding sound can also indicate dirt in the bearing or seriously worn rollers or races.
Long before you are able to feel or hear signs of bearing problems, defects will show up as ultrasonic vibrations. An ultrasound device like this can detect these problems. A vibration detector can also monitor the condition of bearings. Sophisticated devices are being used in some plants. They can be useful tools. But nothing can replace your knowledge, experience, and attention. Use your eyes and ears. If you can catch a problem early, you may be able to avoid a lot of downtime later on. And if you handle and install the new bearing correctly, it will give you service for a long time. I'm Dave Brown for Teletrain.